Hi there and welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar, Precise Positioning Techniques, GNSS Error Sources and Mitigation, sponsored by Novatel and Inside GNSS and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they discuss the leading high-accuracy GNSS techniques of real-time kinematic, or RTK, and precise point positioning. You'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of today's presentation during the Ask the Experts panel session with all three of our panelists. Now, we've invited you along with over 900 professionals from 73 countries and 40 states and provinces representing a variety of industries. And over the next 90 minutes, regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident you'll find today's webinar of value. Before we get started, Glenn Gibbons, editor and publisher at Inside GNSS, would like to take a moment to welcome you and introduce our sponsor for today. Glenn? Thank you, Lori. And to our worldwide audience, Welcome to the sixth and final installment in the Inside GNSS web seminar series for the year 2014. Today's presentation is sponsored by Novatel and addresses a subject that clearly is of major interest to our audience. In fact, today's event has set a new record for registrations for an Inside GNSS webinar. We have more than 900, well more than 900 people from around the world signed up to view this event. Inside GNSS webinars follow the same approach as we take to our engineering-oriented articles in the magazine, and that is to take up issues of current importance to the GNSS community and to bring subject experts to, the, to help us explore those topics in depth. So I encourage those of you viewing our presentation today to contribute to the webinar as well by responding to the questions in our online webinar pools and sending in your questions for the live question and answer periods that will take place during the event. And now I would like to invite Sarah Masterson, new business development manager for Novatel, to say a few words about today's event. Sarah? Thank you, Glenn. I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar on precise positioning techniques today. There are many considerations regarding both hardware and software design that significantly impact GNSS positioning results. Novatel is pleased to have this opportunity to bring together highly respected industry experts in the field of GNSS design to share their insights with you. We hope you will find this information useful as you develop your applications, no matter what industry you are working in. So on behalf of Novatel, again, welcome and enjoy the information. And now I'll pass it back to Glenn to get started. Thank you very much, Sarah. Now I want to turn the uh, proceedings back over to our moderator, Lori Dearman. Lori. Thank you all, and uh, folks, we would like to kick off today's presentation with our first interactive poll. So coming up on your screen, we'd like to hear from you. What level of accuracy do you currently achieve with your GNSS positioning? Is it greater than a meter, less than a meter, a meter, 10 centimeters, or less than 10 centimeters? I see we have 24% um, saying greater than a meter, 11% less than a meter, 10% a meter, 6% saying 10 centimeters and our majority 49 percent saying less than 10 centimeters so thank you for weighing in I know that our presenters will find it very helpful as they go through the content in their presentations joining us today is an esteemed panel of subject matter experts I'm very pleased to welcome Sanjeev Gunawardena, Sanil Bisnath and Sandy Kennedy I will provide a bit more background on each of these speakers as they appear in the program today. So speaking first, we have Sandy Kennedy, currently Director and Chief Engineer of Core Cards uh, at Novatel Inc. Sandy joined Novatel's research group in 2004 after completing a Bachelor's of Science with Honors in 2000 and a Master's of Science in Geomatics Engineering in 2002, both at the University of Calgary and briefly working in pipeline inspection. Sandy helped launch the synchronized position attitude navigation um, span product line in 2005, working as a technical lead and eventually engineering manager for all span products. In 2013, she moved to the core card group, taking up the role of chief engineer for core receiver cards. Her primary motivation is bringing new positioning and navigation capabilities to the marketplace 
to put to use in real world applications. Sandy will be presenting today in two blocks. First, setting up what the webinar is about, namely now that precise GNSS positioning has become much more attainable for more users, what needs to be considered to make sure you're getting the sub decimeter solution that you want. And in our second block at the end, she'll close the theoretical discussion provided by Sanjeev and Sunil by providing some pra a practical example of precise position positioning that illustrates the effect of measurement quality on your end positioning solution. So over to you, Sandy. Great. Thanks very much. All right. So today we're talking about precise GNSS positioning and what's required to achieve it. So from the poll question there, uh, I can see that the majority of people um, listening today are actually already precision users, but to recap, in terms of total GNSS users out there, the majority of people are generally standalone GNSS positioning users. So they're dealing with just pseudo ranges, um, a positioning algorithm, which is generally a fairly basic positioning algorithm, it's probably something least squares based on the code measurements, and they end up with a position that's about 1 to 10 meters in accuracy. Uh, the first step of augmentation that you can add to that is deciding to receive the SBAS correction, something like WAS or maybe EGNOS in Europe, and adding that into your pseudo range positioning to bring your accuracy down to about 0.6 of a meter to 1.5 meters. When we move to precise GNSS positioning, the biggest thing we add is carrier phase data. So that carrier phase data really allows us to access the precision from GNSS. And the positioning algorithm also changes and becomes uh, often much more uh, sophisticated than just your basic pseudo range positioning algorithm. One of the really key inputs, though, is your correction data. So your carrier phases, your pseudo ranges, your correction data, and your uh, advanced positioning algorithm which could be something like RTK offering you centimeter level or possibly better, or PPP offering you um, something more at the several centimeter level. Now, the less than 10 centimeter accuracy has been possible for well over 10 years, um, but why is there suddenly more interest now? Uh, in my view, there's two key enablers for this. The first is easily accessible correction data, and the second is improvements in those advanced positioning algorithms. These two things combined uh, allow for a much more attainable precise position um, that is attainable by more users in uh, many different applications. So easily accessible correction data. 10 plus years ago, doing uh, precise GNSS meant that you had to have your own base station. You were probably using a radio link, which meant you were limited to around three kilometers. And you were definitely affected by terrain. If you were in a valley, if there was buildings around, all these things could affect how, e how often you dropped your RTK correction. And if you're working in an urban area or some sort of you know, busy development site, you definitely were competing for radio channels. Um, and if you're looking to do post-processing, you had long delays, often days long, to get precise clocks and orbits. If you're trying to post-process, you are also responsible for your own base station file as well from that base receiver. And today, there's RTK correction services in most cities and lots of surrounding areas as well. And those are often broadcast over cellular frequencies, so your equipment's set up with a cell modem so you can receive those without the same sort of radio line of sight issues you had before and over a much wider range. Could be a network RTK solution being provided or an individual base station. Uh, if you're post-processing, those base station files are available uh, pretty quickly, usually by the end of the day from something like the Coors Network. And rapid precise clocks and orbits are also available uh, almost real time. And uh, for sure, all of that combines for an increased quality of corrections that are delivered over uh, L-band or the MSS band. And the algorithms have also improved greatly. Uh, RTK today definitely faxes, fixes faster over longer baselines. Um, and as I mentioned, could be a network RTK solution or a single base station. Uh, quality indicators have also become a lot more reliable in the last few years as the uh, positioning technique has really matured in an industrial usage sense. And PPP has really come a long way. Uh, it started off being quite popular in post-processing, and now real-time PPP is definitely a reality. 
Um, I know, you know, <laughs> when I was in grad school, uh, the idea of getting less than 10 centimeters um, in a kinematic application real time using a PPP algorithm, um, there was varying degrees of uh, hope uh, that that would ever become a reality, but it certainly is today. So when, you f you're, when your focus shifts uh, from having a meter level position to having a centimeter level position or having that centimeter level position more often, not just in ideal conditions, um, you have to start looking at what is required for to maintain this level of precision. Um, so it definitely starts with good quality, uh, precise measurements. And to maintain those good quality, precise measurements, uh, there's a few trade-off decisions to be made on antenna and receiver design. Um, if it's something that you've made the choice in the past, you might have chosen something that was good enough and now as you're chasing higher precision, higher accuracy, you may have to make some changes there or maybe you never considered it before and uh, now you're having to make these choices when you're choosing equipment going forward or you did consider it before and now you've got some sort of pressure in terms of reducing the size or the cost of your system and you really have to look at what parts can you trade off on and what parts can you not trade off on to make sure that you get that less than 10 centimeter solution. So with that, I'll pass it back to Lori to start off our um, presentation from Sanjeev. Okay, thanks so much, Sandy. And I know you'll be coming back for part two. So uh, next, Sanjeev Gunawardena, Research Assistant Professor with the Autonomy and Navigation Technology Center at the Air Force Institute of Technology. Previously, he was Senior Research Engineer and Principal Investigator with the Ohio University Avionics Engineering Center, where he led several GNSS software receiver-based R&D projects. Dr. Gunawardena earned a BS in Engineering Physics, BSEE, MSE, and a PhD in electrical engineering from Ohio University. He holds five patents in the area of advanced GNSS receiver design. His research interests include RF design, digital system design, high performance computing, software defined ratio, and all aspects of GNSS receivers and associated signal processing. Sanji will be presenting on GNSS antenna and, receiving, and receiver design considerations for high accuracy applications. Over to you, Sanjeev. Uh, thank you, Lori, and a warm welcome to everyone from around the world. As Lori mentioned, this part of the webinar will cover antenna and receiver design considerations when it comes to high accuracy centimeter level GNSS positioning. My talk is divided into three main areas. First, we'll cover a brief introduction to GNSS signals and how they are processed. Next, we'll take a look at range measurements and how they are computed by the receiver. Finally, we'll go over some finer points of antenna and receiver design when talking about high accuracy GNSS. Now the way a GNSS receiver works is quite different to other types of digital communications receivers like your cell phone, for example. A good way to understand this difference is to take a look at what's known as the link budget for GNSS. Here we see the link budget for the GPS standard positioning service or SPS. Link budgets for other types of GNSS signals are very similar to this. A GPS satellite transmits the SPS signal at a power of about 25 watts. For context, this is about half the power of your car's headlights. And just like how your headlights direct the light towards the road, the satellite has an antenna array that distributes the signal as evenly over the surface of the Earth as possible. However, by the time the transmitted signal from space is received by your antenna, its power is about a tenth of a femtowatt. Now to illustrate how small that is, I was reading an article recently where scientists had estimated the number of sand grains in all the beaches and deserts in the, on Earth. And this is about a 10 to the power 18th type number. This means the GPS signal received by your antenna is like picking up a single grain of sa a sand from the Sahara Desert. On the right hand side, we see equations for computing the thermal noise power. As you can see, at room temperature, thermal noise is about minus 130 dB watts for a bandwidth of about 24 megahertz. This means the signal to noise ratio at the antenna is about negative 30. It's this negative SNR that makes GNSS signal processing very different, as we will see in a few minutes. 
Because the receive signal level is about a thousand times below the noise flow, we can never actually see the signal. By the way, the only way we can directly see GNSS signals is if we point a high gain dish antenna towards the satellite. So the question is, how does any of this work? Well, we use a technique known as correlation. The receiver synthesizes a copy of the signal that it is trying to track. More precisely, it sets up local carrier and, and code replicas. It then multiplies and accumulates the locally generated samples with received signal samples. If the local copy is sufficiently well aligned, we get a huge increase in signal to noise ratio which grows linearly with the correlation time. Using the co correlation result, we can figure out which way and by how much we need to steer the replicas to maintain alignment with the signal that's buried in noise. This process is known as tracking. By integrating the steering commands, we can form two types of range measurements that are based on the code and carry as we will soon see. This correlation based tracking process is like driving a car down the road with your eyes closed and you're only allowed to open your eyes say every second to take a look at the road in front of you. You then have to use that visual information to decide which way and by how much to steer. If the road is windy or you're going fast, you will need to open your eyes more frequently to track the road. In other words, you need a higher update rate and more bandwidth to stay on the road. In the case of GPS tracking, the receiver has to keep up with three types of dynamics. The actual line of sight dynamics and dynamics introduced by the satellite clock and receiver clock. So the quality of your GNSS receiver's measurements are related to the quality of its reference oscillator. This is why high accuracy receivers need to have a good quality low noise oscillator. Uh, now, before I switch this slide, I want everyone to, to let everyone know that the analogy I gave is for illustration purposes only. Uh, don't ever drive with your eyes closed. And remember, you cannot afford to lose lock on the road. Um, this next slide shows the generic architecture of a GNSS receiver. Unlike back in the dawn of GPS where they had analog correlators and the receiver occupied the size of a room, Every receiver in the market today performs digital baseband processing as shown here. As Sandy will tell you later in this webinar, the antenna is the front door of any receiver. The electrical signal from the antenna is amplified, down converted and digitized by the front end. All the frequency synthesis and sampling is locked to the reference oscillator and this receiver clock is one thing that distinguishes the three types of receivers that I'm highlighting. Bandwidth and quantization are also distinguishing factors that are needed to support advanced features such as multipath mitigation, as we will see later. The sample stream from the front end is sent to a multi-channel hardware-based correlation engine that integrates to about a millisecond. After that, the one kilohertz data rate is low enough to be handled by an embedded CPU. The CPU implements tracking channels that steer the hardware-based replicas as we saw previously. The steering information is accumulated to form the pseudo range and accumulated Doppler range measurements at a rate of about every second. The software channels also decode the low data rate navigation message that contains ephemeris and satellite clock model information that is needed to form a position solution. In the case of PPP and RTK, more precise orbit and clock data are received by different means, as Sunil will explain. The table on the left shows the level of measurement accuracy attainable for the type of receiver. Notice that cell phone GNSS receivers usually do not track the carrier and hence only produce a code measurement. This slide highlights some of the distinguishing features of GNSS antennas that are used for cell phone, aviation, and geodetic applications. In general, the design goals for a good GNSS antenna include having a gain pattern for every frequency band that is as constant as possible from zenith down to about 10 degrees elevation. Below 10 degrees, we want the gain to roll off rapidly in order to mitigate ground multipath. In addition, the phase center of the antenna should have minimal variation as a function of azimuth and elevation, 
and should be the same for all GNSS bands. As you will see in Sandy's example towards the latter part of this webinar, these design goals are hard to meet without using exotic materials, careful design and simulation that takes more engineering resources, precision manufacturing and extensive testing. All these obviously drive up the cost of the antenna. This is why tiny chip antennas that are mass produced in the millions end up costing less than $3 each and a high quality multiband antenna with a choke ring that is designed for monitoring station applications can cost many thousands of dollars. Now let's uh, talk about the measurements we get from a GNSS receiver. First off, what we would like to get are absolute line of sight range and velocity measurements to each visible satellite. What we get instead are two types of measurements that stem from the code and carrier tracking process that I described earlier. The code tracking process produces pseudo range measurements that are absolute and unambiguous. However, since this measurement is formed by estimating the timing of chip transitions, where the length of a CA code chip is about 300 meters, we generally end up getting meter level noise on this measurement. It's called pseudo range due to the receiver clock bias that it contains. We will see this in a couple of slides from now. The carrier tracking process can be done in uh, one of two ways, frequency tracking or phase tracking. The carrier only provides a relative range measurement. In phase tracking mode, the local carrier replica is kept phase aligned to the underlying signal. This mode of tracking is the most vulnerable since significant dynamic stress, which may be caused by user motion, oscillator drift, signal fading, multipath or ionospheric scintillation, can cause it to lose lock. But this mode is also, um, it produces the millimeter level carrier phase measurements that are needed for high accuracy applications. This next slide shows a block diagram of the carrier tracking loop and how the measurements are formed. As I mentioned, the steering commands applied to the numerically controlled oscillator that synthesizes the carrier replica are integrated to form the relative range measurement. So basically we are counting carrier cycles over time. This counter can accumulate a large number of integer cycles, but we also need very fine fractional resolution in our measurement. Hence the integer and fractional parts are usually counted separately as shown here. Whenever we need to form a measurement, this count value is extracted and converted to meters by multiplying with the wavelength, which for GPS L1 is about 19 centimeters. The pseudo range measurement by definition is the propagation time of the signal multiplied by the speed of light. This diagram illustrates how we could measure true propagation time if the receiver clock was precisely synchronized to the satellite clocks. In practice, the receiver clock is not synchronized to GPS time. And strictly speaking, even the satellite clocks have an offset from GPS time, which can be computed uh, using the clock parameters in the navigation data message. When a GPS receiver needs to make a pseudo range measurement for the very first time, it makes an educated guess of what the range should be and sets its time of reception register accordingly. This means every code-based measurement will have a bias that is equivalent to the error of that guess. This is why we call the code measurement pseudo range and not range. This slide shows all of the information that the receiver needs to initialize a time of transmission register. GNSS navigation message structures are designed such that the receiver can easily decode this information as quickly as possible. Once this register is set, it is updated by the code replica steering commands. Values can then be extracted exactly the same as for the carrier measurement. Uh, this next figure shows the underlying CA chip shapes of actual GPS signals from receiver front ends of different bandwidths. The processing technique that is used to re recover these chip shapes is described in the references cited. But what I want you to see is that to track the code, the receiver fundamentally performs a timing measurement using the zero crossings of the chip edges. 
the way this is actually done is through the triangular correlation function which by the way is the integral of the chip shape function you can see the steeper the zero crossings are and the more zero crossings there are in a given interval the more accurate the estimate of time will be in contrast if the edges are shallow and noisy the error on the timing estimate will be larger to make the edges sharper means to increase the bandwidth of the front end and this in turn increases the sample rate which means the correlator has to crunch more numbers which means the receiver will consume more power on the other hand a mass market receiver is designed from the ground up to deliver a position fix with as little power consumption as possible so the first thing they do is reduce the bandwidth to the minimum that will produce acceptable position accuracy on the order of tens of meters so as you can see GNSS receivers are designed very differently according to application and market segment now I want to touch on one of the most significant error sources that affect high accuracy applications and that is multipath there are two ways to mitigate multipath the first we saw was antenna technology now let's look at how multipath can be limited as part of the receiver processing the animation on the right shows how the correlation function becomes deformed when a single multipath reflection of half amplitude and 100 meters of delay is added to the direct signal remember that we estimate timing or more precisely relative code phase error from this correlation function notice that the deformation is less near the top of the triangle hence the effect of multipath can be reduced by reducing the correlator spacing the figure on the lower left shows multipath error envelope as a function of multipath delay for various correlator spacings notice that short delay multipath is very difficult to remove and each receiver vendor will have their own patented technology to to do their best in removing this it is also a field of active research now reducing the uh, spacing also causes the noise on the early and late points to become correlated and hence you get less noise on the code measurement this slide shows pseudo range minus carrier phase or as we like to say code minus carrier for an actual receive signal which has some multipath a software receiver allows the same samples to be processed with different receiver parameters as shown here notice how a one chip correlator spacing has meter level pseudo range noise this is reduced to the decimeter level for 160th of a chip also the three and a half meter multipath spike is reduced to about 30 centimeters another factor that affects high accuracy GNSS measurements involves absolute delay and group delay variations of analog components used in the front end of particular concern are saw and bore filters that are used in receivers due to their small size and low cost as you can see absolute delay can significant uh, can vary significantly from device to device and can also vary with temperature for these devices this is of particular concern for precise timing receivers and for FDMA signals such as the current GLONASS constellation the banding you see on the left figure are the pseudo range variations that the IF saw filter induces on different CA code PRNs this variation is on the order of two centimeters and can eat into the error budget for high accuracy and high integrity systems high-end GNSS receivers such as those used for monitoring in reference station in reference stations perform in system calibration for these types of component delays and so do geodetic receivers for GLONASS now finally let's take a look at another lesser known error source and that is signal deformation it turns out that signals transmitted by GNSS satellites contain very subtle variations this this came to light in a big way when researchers started doing detailed high bandwidth analysis on SVN 49 a few years ago it turns out that you can have up to plus minus 10 centimeters of pseudo range error between satellites under certain circumstances signal deformation induced error are of particular concern 
for high accuracy differential systems such as aviation, particularly for the case of dissimilar receiver correlator spacing. Okay, so this brings us to the end of this section that I looked uh, that I looked at that looked at GNSS antenna and receiver design considerations for high accuracy applications. This and the next slide summarize what I covered. I encourage you to review them after the webinar. Uh, thanks very much for your attention and I hope you got a good sense for what goes into designing GNSS antennas and receivers for high accuracy applications. Over to you Lori. Thank you so much, Sanjeev, and uh, folks are going to get to our first Q&A segment. Uh, first question, going over to Sandy. What will Beto or Galileo add to any type of precise positioning method? Well, the primary thing that um, two new constellations would add would be more satellites, which means more measurements that are available. Um, in a lovely open sky type of environment, it may not make that much of a difference, but if you're any place with an obstructed view to the sky because you're in an urban area or, or trees or anything like that, having more possibilities to make a measurement to a satellite will ensure the signal availability needed to continue computing that uh, very precise, highly accurate solution. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go over to um, Sunil. Sunil Adams asking, what would you say is the difference in accuracy comparing a higher grade receiver, a Novatel Trimble, for example, to a lower grade uh, U-blocks in similar situations using differential positioning? And I have a little add-on here. If you could add one thing to a lower grade receiver to improve accuracy, what would you add? Better clock? Additional frequency, more constellation, uh, MEMS, IMU, or things like that. And uh, Sana, let me know if you need to hear any of that over again. Uh, thanks for the question, Adam. Um, I can I can give you an answer that would take half an hour, but uh, in the interest of time, I'd keep it short. Um, uh, in in a differential situation, um, uh, the answer is a, most answers are. It depends. Over very short uh, baselines of a few hundred meters or so, uh, in some cases, that uh, that single frequency U box U box like uh, receiver would produce fairly good uh, um, results if it had good quality carrier phase uh, on the single frequency. Um, However, as the baselines get longer um, into the kilometers and many kilometer range, then um, you would see quite a precipitous drop off where we are still producing a few centimeter level results with a high quality receiver. Um, you would not be uh, anywhere close to that uh, with a, a low cost unit that would uh, have you at the, the sub meter level. Um, uh, very quickly. Uh, if I had the choice to to make an addition to a low-cost receiver, I guess uh, a higher quality or good quality um, phase on, on the L1 that you'd be tracking uh, would be my, my first uh, choice, uh, good quality low noise without cycle slips or reduced cycle slips. If there is good quality phase, then uh, my next choice would be to add uh, the second uh, carrier frequency to allow for more precise and robust positioning under different circumstances. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we're going over to Sanjeev. Thomas is asking, in Rhinex files, I see phase observations that are negative, which I find confusing. How can phase observations become negative? Also, they frequently cannot be multiplied by wavelength to produce a range, which is confusing for similar reason. I'd appreciate any light that, you can, that uh, can be shown on this. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Thomas. So, so basically, uh, carrier phase observations are relative measurements. So, if some receivers actually before, after the the carrier tracking loop has settled down, it will initialize the measurement to the value that's uh, shown by the pseudo range. Other receivers will just initialize to zero. So, as the satellite trajectory changes, you could have negative. Uh, carrier phase measurements in that sense. Um, so, so basically, that that uh, that's the reason why you have uh, negative values for carrier phase. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, next one. One more for you, Sanjeev, from Logan Scott. Uh, what advantage for more than 3-bit ADC? Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Logan, for that question. So it's true that after about 3 bits, uh, the correlation uh, gain that you get from having more than uh, 3 bits uh, goes down to about a fraction of a dB, like something like 0 0.05 dBs. Um, so there's no real advantage for having more bits uh, in, in a benign signal situation. But what happens is those extra bits give you dynamic range that you can use if you have uh, interference uh, on the GNSS band. So before you send samples into the correlator, uh, having more dynamic range allows you to implement some kind of interference pro rejection processing uh, to get rid of some of that interference um, before it goes into the correlators. Now, mind you, that only works for uh, interference that is typically low bandwidth. If you have, uh, you know, noise-like interference, then having more bits doesn't uh, help you much because of the just the way the the uh, wideband interference uh, is set up. Okay, thank you. This is the last question that we'll uh, respond to during this Q&A segment. We'll uh, get back to these at the end. So over to you, Sandy. Anas is asking, Sandy stated that now we can acquire a centimeter level accuracy using RTK and PPP, but what if the receiver is in, in an urban canyon like downtown Calgary where multipath is dominant? Centimeter level accuracy cannot be easily achieved. Right. So, well, in any sort of urban canyon downtown environment, um, the biggest challenge is the number of signals that are available by direct line of sight. So, multipath is a problem. Direct reflected signals are actually a larger problem um, because a lot of the pure multipath and not a direct reflected signal is often handled well by uh, both your antenna design and then your correlator on board. Um, so, the, the biggest kind of um, the, it, it's actually the number of signals available that are the biggest detriment to that centimeter level of accuracy. And indeed, both RTK and PPP, especially PPP, will struggle in those um, in conditions where signal availability is really compromised. Um, and that's when people generally start looking at augmentation with something like inertial if they need to maintain centimeter level accuracy continuously through a downtown area. All right. Thank you, Sandy. And Sunil and Sanjeev, and at this point, we're going to wrap our Q&A and go to our second poll for today. Question is, what accuracy would you like to get in the future? Greater than a meter, less than a meter, a meter, 10 centimeters, less than 10 centimeters. Okay, looks like a percent looking for greater than a meter, 6% less than a meter, 3% meter, 17% 7, looking for 10 centimeters and then 73% looking for less than 10 centimeters. So thank you again for weighing in. I would like at this time to bring on Dr. Sunil Bisnath, an associate professor at the Department of Earth and Space Science and Engineering at York University in Toronto, Canada. His research interests include precise GNSS positioning and navigation algorithms and applications. Previous to, to York University, Professor Bisnath has held the position of geodesist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Boston, Massachusetts, and assistant research scientist at the University of Southern Mississippi, NASA Stennis Space Center, Mississippi. He holds an honors uh, bachelor's of science and master's of science in surveying science from the University of Toronto and a PhD in Geodesy and Geomatics Engineering from the University of New Brunswick. Sano will now discuss software processing requirements for precise GNSS positioning. Over to you, Sano. Thanks, Lori, and uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. So following on from uh, Sandy's uh, discussion and Sanjeev's, um, just to put everything uh, together in terms of uh, what drive GNSS performance? It's the quality and the type of measurements we're making, that is the quality of the antenna and the receiver that are being used, um, 
combined with uh, the error modeling or the, the methods that we use to mitigate the errors in the measurements, and there's a long list of, uh, of errors to be modeled, which we'll talk about briefly soon. And, and finally, the third component is the mode of positioning that we're using, and the terms RTK and network RTK have been, uh, have been uh, used repeatedly already. Uh, so we will uh, talk about those uh, in relation to um, standard point positioning. Um, now the requirements for standard uh, positioning uh, in, in GPS or in GNSS generally, uh, but in this example specifically for G GPS is one continuous CA code uh, measurements uh, from a minimum of four satellites. Uh, and the result is the computation of the user's uh, 3D position and the receiver's timing error. Uh, perhaps there could be some uh, filtering and use of the L1 carrier phase measurement if the receiver has that capability and the software has that capability. Uh, the quality of the CA code measurements uh, used in this uh, mode are, is on the order of a meter um, with noise and sometimes significant multipath. We want to keep in mind that this is the mode of operation for almost all uh, GPS or GNSS users. Roughly 99% of, uh, of satellite-based positioning users are standard positioning users. And what we're talking about in this webinar is the, a transition from uh, this few meter level positioning to uh, something more precise, which from the polls it shows that uh, many of you are already there and many more of you would, that would like to transition to, to more accuracy. Uh, the components for precise uh, positioning are, of course, the receiver and the antenna uh, assembly, uh, additional infrastructure, um, communication links, both of which Sandy has uh, mentioned, uh, measurement corrections, and data processing. So we want to focus uh, uh, over the next few minutes on, on the latter two. In terms of the receiver, though at the end of related antenna, going back to Sanjeev's talk, uh, for precise positioning the requirement is a high performance uh, geodetic grade antenna which consists of the uh, L1 CA code tracking um, plus in some cases the L1 uh, P code tracking if it's available uh, on the receiver as well as the L1 carrier phase, also the L2 um, P code and the L2 carrier phase. In terms of tracking performance, the PICO tracking on the order of tens of centimeters plus multipath and noise, and the carrier phase tracking on the order of a few millimeters uh, plus uh, multipath and noise, uh, very precise but uh, an ambiguous range measurement as Sanjeev uh, has described. Uh, generally speaking, the infrastructure requirements uh, for the bare minimum in baseline RTK, uh, the requirement of a second uh, high quality receiver or um, in the case of network RTK as we'll see, uh, working within a network of receivers and receiving additional uh, GNSS signals and corrections or in the case of uh, PPP, receiving additional corrections to your high quality receiver. Uh, we can talk for hours about uh, the major error sources involved and how to mitigate or correct or model these errors. Uh, in the uh, bibliography that will be provided, there are a number of references, textbooks and otherwise, that go into great detail about these errors. Uh, one way to uh, envision the errors and categorize them is in terms of errors of generation at the generation source at the satellites or transmission uh, and at uh, reception at the antenna receiver um, assembly. In terms of the generation errors, uh, the, some of the largest ones are the orbit and clock errors, errors in the orbital position of the, the satellite and uh, the, the clock uh, values compared to the actual, uh, what the actual clock values are versus the measured ones. Um, we also have a number of phase center corrections. Uh, the antennas uh, cannot be manufactured perfectly, so there are offsets of the phase, the, the uh, 
the phase centers as well as variation of the phase centers as the signals are transmitted in different directions. There's also the phase wind-up uh, term that's uh, a function of the changing orientation um, of the transmitting and receiving antennas and then various equipment delays, some that are large, some that are small, some that are uh, calibrated or can be calibrated easily and others that are much more difficult to determine. In terms of transmission, I would think uh, most uh, most people are aware of the atmospheric refraction that tends to be um, separated into the ionospheric and tropospheric components, and uh, they will impact all the signals from any GNSS as the signals uh, transmit through um, the Earth's atmosphere to the receiver. At the reception end, we have the, some similar errors, uh, antenna errors, the phase center offset, phase center variation, and phase wind up. There's also the significant issue of multipath of multiple signals reaching the antenna, uh, equipment delays as well, receiver noise, and then some uh, site specific site displacement errors such as solid earth tides and ocean loading. Now, I know the next slide is a, a rather busy one, but the purpose was to try to describe those errors in a single slide uh, um, and talk about the errors, their magnitudes, how they're managed, and what the residual errors are after we manage them. In this case, for the typical PPP or precise point positioning process. So what we have in the first column is the effects that we talked about on the previous slide. The second column, the magnitudes that you can see range from centimeters to, in some cases, uh, tens of meters. Uh, the third column, the domain, whether they're affecting the range uh, measurement itself or affecting the, the position solution. Uh, possible means in the next column for mitigating, uh, many of which are involve modeling, whether we have closed form models, straightforward equations, or complicated equations filtering process and others. And the last column refers to the residual error. The key is how well we can model these errors and bring those residual errors down to the millimeter or few millimeter level if possible to allow us to, to reach our goal of centimeter or few centimeter positioning. Now, one aspect of the errors that we should uh, talk about that is very important, uh, especially when we're referring to differential or relative positioning, is uh, spatial decorrelation. So what we have in this example, that's a cartoon not to scale, we have atmospheric refraction, the ionospheric and tropospheric refraction, and we have on the bottom left of the figure two receivers that are relatively close uh, together, and what we see is that the signals um, transit through the same portions or very similar portions of the ionosphere and troposphere causing similar delay. Whereas for the third antenna in this description off on the right, uh, we, we are trans where the signal is transiting through rather different portions of the ionosphere and troposphere and we would expect the delays to be different. We make use of um, the spatial decorrelation idea in relative positioning or differential positioning uh, to say that if two receivers are close together, some of these delays are very simple, similar and by simple differencing, we can cancel out or calibrate out these errors. This idea was moved forward into uh, relative positioning in the idea of the double difference. And a double difference is just a mathematical uh, a straightforward mathematical difference of simultaneous measurements from two satellites, in this case J and K, and two antennas A and B. And through this differencing process, we can cancel out errors that are either the same, such as the satellite clocks and the receiver clock errors, or errors that are, are very similar, let's say on a short baseline, the atmospheric errors. The double, this double differencing approach uh, m allow for uh, GPS initially to become very, very good at baseline vector determination, that is relative positioning. Um, 
However, a key component of dealing with this is resolving the ambiguity terms that Sanjeev talked about, the, the ambiguity, the unknown number of cycles in the accumulated carrier phase measurement. And this is, uh, was a significant component of the research development, which involved the generation of potential ambiguity candidates, the identification of an optimum candidate through typically a least squares process and then the validation of the selected ambiguities. And once we were able to estimate the integer ambiguities on the carry phase measurements quite well, then relative positioning became very powerful and is a very powerful technique. Um, some characteristics of it is the more data we have, the, uh, the more accurate the positioning will be. Dual frequency results much better than single frequency. And the error modeling and ambiguity resolution algorithms used really drive the quality of those solutions. In terms of performance, in terms of static uh, performance, over long baselines, we're able to produce centimeter to few millimeter uh, performance over hundreds to thousands of kilometers and a few centimeter uh, level results kinematically over shorter baselines, the result of which is baseline RTK or real-time kinematic. What we can do beyond real-time kinematic, which we have uh, on the figure on the left with many reference stations, is we can pull the resources from those reference stations, that is the, the reference station data, and the result is network RTK, where we only need a, a, a few, a handful of reference stations over large areas. Uh, we use the data to estimate orbit and atmospheric corrections that we can then transmit to the, to the network RTK user. Another uh, approach is uh, what's referred to as PPP, or precise point positioning. And in this figure, on the left, we have our standard positioning that 99% of our uh, of us use and on the right PPP and what we see with PPP is enhanced orbit and clock information that's derived from other sources uh, tracking networks um, for the GPS or GNSS satellites we use uh, dual frequency code and phase measurements uh, much more um, complicated sequential filtering is used and um, much more of the error modeling that we've described. And the result is we go from few meter level positioning to centimeter down to few meter, uh, uh, tens of centimeters down to few millimeter level positioning. In this figure, we have a, a, what is now a sort of a classical static PPP result, a 24 hour result. Uh, in green or horizontal solutions, in red the vertical, this is uh, from 10 centimeters, uh, the, the y-axis is from 0 to 10 centimeters, and uh, what's so characteristic about this is the initial convergence period, the few tens of, set, uh, the few tens of um, minutes at the start of the solution, uh, where, the, where we have a convergence of the solution, which is basically the solution going from a pseudo range uh, weighted solution to a carrier phase weighted solution. And as Sandy has described, PVP is quite sensitive to the quality of the measurements, uh, more so than RTK. So we see this characteristic convergence and then very good a few centimeter positioning and actually after 24 hours, the bias in these solutions are on the order of, uh, of uh, a few millimeters. So this being said, um, and given time, I'd like to close off with this one final slide of current status and, and what we'll see in the near future. In terms of RTK and network RTK, this is now mature technology. It's an industry standard. In most uh, developed urban areas, there are network, there are RTK networks. PPP is the standard for high precision remote operation and research continues. The infrastructure and usage of all these technologies continues to grow, hence the, the popularity of this webinar um, today. Uh, in the near future, we'll see more, we're seeing more signals enhancing RTK and PPP performance. Uh, for example, most network RTK services are now GPS and PPP, uh, GPS and GLONASS enabled. And GPS plus GLONASS PPP clearly shows a reduction in initial convergence period. Um, what um, 
we're also seeing a faster reconvergence in PPP and PPP ambiguity resolved um, solutions being provided by industry. Um, however, the goal is still RTK-like initialization for PPP. So with that, I'd like to stop and pass, pass it back to uh, Lori. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, next we have Sandy Kennedy coming back to uh, give us a practical example. So I'll pass it over to you, Sandy. All right, so now we're going to look at a practical example of precise positioning and uh, some of the uh, effects we had on our final positioning solution based on some of our hardware choices. So the uh, application we're going to look at is precision in agriculture. Uh, the positioning accuracy requirement here is that less than 10 centimeters we've been talking about. Uh, we've chosen to use the TerraStar D correction source and uh, with that uh, the algorithm deployed is the precise point positioning uh, style of algorithm. Um, the rationale for this choice, why did we choose this? Well, it meets the accuracy requirement. We'll be in a primarily open sky situation, which means we have a good line of sight the ge to the geostationary satellite providing those corrections, the TerraStar D corrections there. Uh, given that we're a farm implement, we're not expecting any extreme maneuvers, as in we aren't expecting any sort of barrel rolls where we'll have a total blockage obstruction of the GNSS signals, uh, and we should have a continuous solution throughout. Sometimes you can get some blockages at the um, end of, um, if there's tree rows at the end of the field, but it's generally not an entirely entire blockage, so you can uh, maintain your solution um, through those turns typically. Uh, the TerraStar D uh, correction source is providing corrections for both GPS and GLONASS uh, L1 and L2 there. So we have to pick uh, our hardware to uh, be able to make our measurements. Um, the first thing is the antenna, which is the front door to the receiver. So at the very least, that antenna needs to be able to receive uh, all the frequencies that we're dealing with here, uh, which is the correction signal, which is down around 15, 35 megahertz, and then GPS, GLONASS L1 and L2. Uh, followed by that, we need to have a receiver that's uh, taking that RF input uh, that's capable of actually tracking and decoding our correction service, um, and as well as the GPS L1 and L2, that's the bare minimum. Uh, and then, in this case, we're using a Novotel receiver, an OEM628, so we're minimizing our multipath by the pulse aperture correlator technology that's on board, and the PPP engine is also on board the receiver as well. So antennas are um, often taken for granted and they're often viewed as a cost-saving opportunity and on the other side of that they're often part of the system depending on the application um, that have size constraints uh, or people are desiring the smallest antenna possible. Uh, in precision agriculture it's not too much of a concern here uh, but in this example we're uh, the size isn't that much of a concern is what I meant to say. Um, in this example we're going to look at the effect of three different antenna choices. Um, the first one is a top quality ge ge geodetic grade type of antenna which is a pinwheel from Novotel. We'll look at a mid-range antenna which is still good quality but has some design compromises. And finally we'll look at a low cost antenna that claims to support all the necessary frequencies um, and that's all we actually really know about it. It's a low cost antenna, it's a patch design Design, and it should support all the frequencies that we uh, need here. So to test our system here, we uh, got out the trusty test van here and uh, uh, installed th the three antennas on the roof of the van. In the center here is where the geodetic, geodetic grade antenna was mounted and its signal was split to uh, both a receiver under test uh, as well as our reference system. So the reference system uh, was a SPAN CPT, GP, uh, GNSS INS um, uh, system, which we then post-processed as well to have the highest accuracy solution we could. And primarily what we were after there was an attitude knowledge of the vehicle. And that was because we measured these offset vectors or lever arms from our ge geodetic grade antenna to both the low cost and the mid range. And to be able to translate that uh, reference solution from this location over to the other uh, antennas under test locations, you need to have attitude. So just to recap, our reference is a GPS, a GNSS INS um, 
uh, system and uh, we calculated our position errors by moving the reference solution over to each of the unit under test locations and differencing the reference and UUT trajectories. Uh, we drove a route uh, with a pretty good clear view of the sky, just sort of suburban area around uh, Novotel's offices here. And what did we get for a solution? Oh, I'm ahead of myself. So just to recap, um, we're looking at the only difference in this is the antenna choice. So we've got the same signals in space for both the corrections as well as the GNSS signals, same receiver model and the same positioning algorithm used. So this is a plot of what we got for uh, 2D or horizontal position errors looking at the three different types of antennas used here. So you can see the geodetic grade in the darkest blue line is uh, hovering along here uh, at sort of a mean of maybe five or six centimeters. We're just catching it at the tail end of the convergence period here. And you can see that the low cost antenna had a much more difficult time uh, converging. And it finally did converge to a fairly um, uh, comparable accuracy level, but then bumped up here. Um, and if you looked in uh, including the height error into a 3D um, solution, 3D measure of the errors, you can see that the low cost antenna is really suffering. We are dealing with um, a much longer convergence time and then an error at the sort of few decimeter level rather than a sub decimeter level. Um, the difference between the geodetic grade and the mid grade antenna, uh, not so much, uh, did quite well. I, I would say that they are very comparable there. So what exactly went wrong here? What was the root cause on this? So we started troubleshooting our usual suspects. Was it a subscription issue? No, all three receivers had an active Terrastar D um, subscription running on it. Was there some sort of obstruction on one antenna on that low cost antenna, say a pigeon or some other unwelcome visitor riding along? No, that wasn't the case. Um, and the root cause really boiled down to the antenna performance and what does frequency support really mean? So just a little bit of background here. Uh, this is uh, an attempt at drawing an ideal uh, antenna gain pattern. Um, so what we're looking at here is that you have a maximum gain up at zenith. This is if you're looking straight up overhead. And this is dropping all the way down to the horizon and then below the horizon. And this is a, a cross section. Imagine the overall antenna gain pattern uh, looks something like a mushroom cap. Uh, where your gains drop off uh, to be uh, minimal below the horizon and it's a it's a 3D thing. Um, if you were to have an ideal antenna gain pattern, meaning that that mushroom cap had no dents or, or sort of bumps pushing out of it, you would be able to cut a cross section of it and then you could represent the whole antenna pattern by rotating the cross section around this axis here. And that's the ideal, a nice, smooth, uh, and ideally uh, a high gain all the way down to um, uh, the horizon and then sharply dropping off after that. So what do we actually have for antenna gain patterns here? Uh, this is uh, the geodetic grade antenna gain pattern for the right-handed uh, signals coming in and across all the frequencies that we're interested here. So first thing is good, the maximum gain is, is up at the zenith. You'll notice this thickness here, and the thickness is actually the result of several lines blurring together on this, um, or running together on this plot. Um, this was each line, which you can't distinguish here, it looks like just a big fat line. It was uh, measurements taken around different azimuths. So imagine a stationary satellite, your ideal antenna gain pattern sitting there, and these are the measurements we take a cross section at each uh, sort of azimuth position or o'clock position. So imagine and rotating your antenna under that stationary signal. So everything looks as expected here. Um, and then we move to what's going on with our low cost antenna. There we go. And this is the root of our problem. So first of all, on some of our signals here, uh, on our L2, you'll see that the maximum gain is not happening at zenith. Um, in fact, the gain is uh, lower here at zenith. And then on the other signals, on L1, we've got a very low gain at what would normally be considered a, a high quality area of the sky. So here we're at about maybe minus, or about 25 degrees off of the zenith. 
Um, and normally that would be a great satellite, but in this antenna it's actually working to uh, attenuate it, almost acting like a signal blockage in there. So basically with your antenna gains being all over the map here, um, the signals that are making it into your receiver and then into your algorithm are not quite what you'd expect. You, you almost have an availability problem here. So to conclude, uh, it's really important that you uh, know your measurement chain. Uh, maintain your signal quality at each component of it uh, and trade off where you can, where you need to, uh, but make sure that you aren't sacrificing any of the fundamentals um, and enjoy that um, sub 10 centimeter positioning. I'll hand it back to you, Lori. Okay, thank you, Sandy. And uh, folks, before we get to the questions that are coming into the queue, wanted to just cover some next steps if you'd like to visit uh, www.insidegnss.com forward slash webinars. Uh, you can get a copy of a, the PDF of today's presentation as well as a bibliography. And uh, if you would like to contact today's panel with questions or comments, you can use info at insidegnss.com uh, and those will be forwarded along uh, as appropriate. Wanted to close things out with our final poll for today and would like to hear from each of you. What additional functionality would you like to have in your GNSS? Uh, is it higher accuracy, greater availability, robustness? And in this case, it's, it is on the honor system to select up to two. So not all, but one or two. Uh, greater availability or robustness, greater redundancy, greater integrity. So again, give us uh, your top one or your top Two. And it looks like 53% saying higher accuracy, 65% saying greater availability or robustness, 13% greater redundancy, and 48% saying greater integrity. So thank you for that. Okay, I'd like to go to the first question we have in our queue, and I'm going to go over to uh, you, Sunil. Hans is asking, please discuss the impact of tri landing on accuracies. Great. Thanks for the question. And hi, Hans. Uh, nice to hear that you're on with us uh, today. Um, well, trilining, I guess, uh, will have a, a number of impacts um, that uh, many of us already know about. I mean, in terms of uh, components like, uh, if you mean specifically the third frequency, uh, we will see better ionospheric um, estimation and that will help RTK um, uh, over uh, longer baselines. Uh, in terms of simulations that we've seen for PPP, we've seen much uh, faster uh, uh, um, initial convergence, the ability to, with the additional uh, signal to be able to, and the additional measurements that, in, that are entailed, uh, to be able to more quickly estimate uh, float ambiguities uh, with uh, better precision. Um, of course, simulations tend to be optimistic in nature, uh, but we will see improvements. So I'll, I'll stop there, Lori. Okay. Anybody else on our panel want to jump in? Okay. And as I ask these questions, I'll, I'll be uh, sending them to one panel member, but uh, if you'd like to uh, weigh in on anything, please do just jump right in. So next one, going over to Sandy. Christian's asking, do geodetic receivers usually employ inertial aiding of the carrier loops, e.g. Novatel with span? Uh, yeah, well, typically not, actually. The inertial aiding of the tracking loops is, uh, is, is definitely something that's a little bit specific to Novatel span architecture. Um, it, it can be an add-on, uh, but it depends on um, sort of the trade-off in terms of uh, what's that worth in terms of added system cost and complexity um, to add an inertial there, um, and then kind of what quality of aiding you need to get off of that. So definitely as uh, inertials come down in size and cost, it might be something that you'd see more frequently, um, but it it, it does add a little bit more complexity um, to your system to make sure that that aid to your tracking loop is truly an aid and not a detriment. Okay. Going over to, let's see, Sanjeev. Uh, Mata's asking, 
how to calculate number of cycles or ambiguity between satellite and receiver in carrier phase recovery. Okay, yeah, thanks for the question, Mara. So, so basically, uh, what you're asking is how do you, uh, you know, lock on to the right combination of ambiguities uh, for the different, uh, according to the geometry that you, that you have. So there's uh, quite a number of algorithms that uh, essentially what you're doing is it's a, a carrier cycle search process. And there's a number of algorithms, and I think uh, one of the most uh, famous ones is uh, something that was developed, I think, by uh, Delft University, and it's called the Lambda method. So if you Google uh, the Lambda method, there's uh, going to be quite a lot of uh, references that come up, and that uh, those uh, articles will give you a good uh, overview of what that method is about. Okay, thank you. Okay, this one for Sunil Alessandro is asking, does the different ref systems affect the final accuracy in the positioning? Um, okay, I'm trying to understand exactly what the question is because it can be applied to many things. But for example, if we're talking about, uh, use the PPP example, and we are using um, measurements from multiple systems, GPS, GLONASS, etc., uh, they they will have an impact on the final ac accuracy if if we do not recognize the differences between the spatial reference systems. Let's say between GPS and and, and GLONASS, um, they uh, they use different um, datums, and also the time systems. Uh, clearly, they're using different time systems. So, if the we model the differences correctly, or in some cases estimate the differences, uh, some of the differences in the processing, um, there will be um, very little impact of the, of the different systems. So uh, if we recognize the, the differences and we take into account the differences, uh, we can combine data from different constellations uh, quite, quite well. Lori? Okay, thank you. Uh, I've got one more for you here, Sunil, and um, let's see. Uh, Andy's asking, how strongly does in-band interference affect accuracy? Does process, sorry, does processing gain make it unimportant? Uh, well, I can answer that, but maybe I should pass that to Sanjeev. He, he may have a, um, uh, he may prefer to answer it. So let Sanjeev? me re-ask re the question, Sanjeev, <laughs> just in case you missed sure. it. Um, how strongly does in-band interference affect accuracy, and does processing gain make it unimportant? Um, so it depends on the type of interference. Uh, I mean, m most of these questions are like, it depends. Um, so what can happen is, uh, so interference, uh, basically it reduces your signal-to-noise ratio um, because whatever that's not the signal looks like noise and so as a result the signal to noise ratio goes down but there's certain kinds of interference that also deform the shape of your correlation function so so um, something like CW or swept CW can also alter the the shape of your um, correlation function and hence uh, you know add additional error so uh, something like wideband interference, there's ways to, you know, you could integrate for longer and get your signal-to-noise ratio back, which, which you're saying uh, is the processing gain, so you add more gain, and uh, you can hence uh, kind of mitigate some of that wideband interference. But then uh, you also need to have the right receiver architecture in order to do that. So, for example, in order to increase your... Uh, processing gain or, or integrate for longer, like, like I was mentioning in my talk, you need to have a really good oscillator that does not drift too much over the shorter time frame. So, you know, it, it really depends on how the receiver is designed and then the type of interference. And, uh, you know, so in general, if you have more number of bits, like the, the question that was asked previously, it allows you to have more dynamic range. And then if you have a good oscillator, uh, it allows you to go longer in integration. So, so long story short, the more expensive and more complex the receiver is, it can uh, you know, handle 
more inter uh, handle higher levels of interference by design. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one over to you, Sandy. David is asking, given an automotive inertial solution, how do you see using PPP or RTK in deep urbans like Chicago? Right. So in those deep urban canyons where you're going to struggle to hold on to a, a converged PPP or a fixed RTK solution, um, how, how is it of any use to you? Well, the first part of it is it's of use to you as you if you started outside the urban canyon and you're coming in. Um, so you could hang on to that sort of centimeter level of accuracy as you head into the urban canyon. So how are you hanging on to it? it it's partly on your inertials, uh, but the other way you can hang on to it is leveraging exactly the same thing that PPP and RTK are working on, which is a nice, precise carrier phase measurement. So if you're doing something like a delta phase update, it allows you to do a very precise relative displacement of your solution coming in. Um, so specifically PPP or RTK, if you're purely in those deep urban canyons, uh, you're may not get the most benefit out of it, but the same basis of the precise carrier phase measurements will help you in those urban canyons. Okay, David, as a follow-on question to that, Sandy, uh, what mm -hmm. would you recommend for using as a ground truth to validate said solution? Uh, the ground truth. Well, if you can get some imagery, it's always good to be able to overlay um, your actual tracks to imagery. That just lets you see a, a spatial view of it and not a time view of it. Um, and then the other thing you can do is if you have a higher quality solution that you can post-process, post, post uh, higher quality GNSS, INS solution, post-process it so you can actually do a, a time series comparison and look at your um, unit under test um, errors over time. Okay, going over to you, Sunil. Uh, Eli is asking, which signals have been proven and are appropriate for tracking to obtain precise measurements? Are there any advantages between GPS and GLONASS, PL1 and PL2, L2C, and GPS L5? Uh, Eli, thanks for the question. Again, uh, we, can all pro we can provide long answers to all these questions. Um, in terms of if the signals are proven, um, the basic answer is they've all been proven. Uh, they they do each have different characteristics. They have different um, accuracies and different signal strengths. Uh, specifically, in terms of GPS, um, let's say if we're talking about uh, the L1 CA code versus P code, the, the P code uh, being a, a higher chipping rate uh, is is more precise than the CA code in terms of L2C, um, let's say, versus um, uh, the CA code on L1, well, L1's transmitted at a slightly higher power, so they're, they're, the, the signal strength's a little higher. Comparing GPS with GLONASS, um, given that uh, GLONASS, uh, each satellite's transmitting at a different frequency, uh, there are some issues in terms of its processing, whether it's RTK or PPP. We have a very good understanding of the differences in the processing, so they're taken into account, but it does have an effect, uh, a slight effect on the GLONASS measurements. Um, Lori, I think I'll just stop there. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Sanjeev, over to you, and Mohammed's asking, when a limited number of satellites is visible, let's say four, and the signal is weak but still within range, would a beam-forming array with beams pointed to the satellite signals increase the accuracy? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good question, interesting question. Um, so it's true that in theory, if you have a beam steering array, you can get more gain uh, by steering beams towards the satellites. But the, the thing is, it, it kind of depends because uh, beam steering uh, does two things. Well, first of all, you're increasing the complexity of the receiver by a huge amount. So each, you know, you're having multiple elements. Each of those elements has to have a, a different front end and digitize that to multiple sample streams. Uh, the processing, uh, the baseband processing becomes more uh, involved and complex. So it, it kind of, uh, you know, depending on that application you're trying to solve, uh, 
like for example if if this is a stationary application you might do much better by having a, a really good uh, local reference oscillator and implementing a long coherent integration to track those uh, low uh, signal to noise ratio satellites as opposed to doing something like beam steering uh, also beam steering has a, a issue and i think it uh, it was covered by one of the previous webinars uh, and that is uh, when you steer beams it becomes difficult to maintain the phase center of your uh, combined uh, multi-element antenna so that's another thing that you have to kind of take into consideration so so overall beam steering is is very complex and ex expensive and there may be other ways to get there with much uh, less uh, um, size weight and power and cost okay thank you uh, next over to Sandy Emmanuel is asking, what is the setting initial, uh, initialization time for PPP to achieve about 5 centimeter accuracy in current state-of-the-art geodetic receivers such as Novatel? And what is the reason for longer initialization times currently mentioned? Right. So if we're looking at the settling or initialization time um, to converge down to that 5 centimeter accuracy, uh, typically you're looking at something on the order of about 20 minutes. Um, and what's the reason for how long this takes? Well, part of it is in PPP, you're actually trying to, um, in real time, actually estimate and model many of the errors that are um, differenced out when you're doing an RTK approach. So um, the initialization time required is, is how much time it's required for the algorithm to start separating the different error sources. Um, and part of that, um, depending on the quality of your correction signal, um, it depends on sort of the fuzziness on how you have, how well you know your different errors you're trying to model. Um, and the time period is really related um, to uh, the geometry change. So your satellites move across the sky and as they move across the sky it starts to let you break apart the errors so you can separate an atmospheric error from an orbital error for example. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the reason that is as long as it does is, is partly around just the geometry of what it is. Well, part of it is, is what you're trying to separate and uh, part of it is, is the quality of corrections that you're starting from. That sort of X naught of what you're solving for. Okay, and this is the last question we'll have time for today. Uh, for you, Sunil, Jack's asking, can any can or can you comment on PPP with integer and zero difference ambiguity resolution? Do any of the current PPP services utilize that technology in addition to the nominal real-time delivery of better, in quotes, uh, orbits and clocks? Uh, thanks for the question, Jack. And if this is a Jack Raleigh I know, hi, how are you doing? Um, uh, it, it's a it's a great question and it's one that's that's asked. Um, yes, uh, the the latest and greatest in in PPP is resolving the ambiguity. Sandy was just referring to different error sources and and the and the and separating them. In one the one major one is is estimating the ambiguities and and that's done as as we we talked in the webinar uh, that's done uh, first at the stage of estimating them as real valued and then later on trying to fix them uh, to counts because they're counts of the number of cycles uh, so it's a it's an it's an integer count um, and in ter so so that has been done it's successfully done um, it requires some additional correction information for what I refer to as the um, uh, um, fractional phase biases uh, of, of the measurements in the network that's used to generate the orbits and clocks, uh, clock corrections for the user. So additional corrections are required, and uh, um, all of the uh, the um, commercial providers are uh, working on such solutions, or have introduced, or are introducing. Um, ambiguity resolved uh, PPP at this point. All right. Lori? Well, thank you so much. And it is about that time. I'd like to ask, uh, about that time to wrap things up. And I'd like to invite Sarah Masterson from our sponsor of Novatel to leave us with a brief word. 
Okay, thanks, Laurie. I hope everyone found the information presented today helpful and interesting. I want to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to prepare and present this information for the webinar attendees. Novotel has been designing GNSS receiver technology for many years and has additional information in the form of technical papers and case studies on our website. On behalf of Novotel, thanks for attending today's webinar, and be sure to check out upcoming Novotel webinars on topics such as interference mitigation under the Events tab on our website at Novotel.com. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah. And folks, before we sign off, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us. Trust that you found today to be of value. Uh, special thanks to Sunil Sanjeev and Sandy, and of course, our sponsor and co-host, Novotel and Inside GNSS. And would like to thank our logistics producer, Patty Van Hooser, for her behind-the-scenes collaboration and support as well. And again, thank you for joining us. This is Lori Dearman saying have a great rest of the week.